Recently, I decided to create my own custom ESP32 breakout board. I wanted a design that not only works on its own, but can also serve as a tested template for the future projects, something I can easily integrate into my next designs. Today, I am focusing on a version you can send directly to a manufacturer. If you use the same design or follow the tips I show you, you'll be able to make your own as well. In this video, I'll walk you through exactly how I did it so you can follow along and build your own too. The ESP32 is definitely a favorite in the maker community. You can easily get a ready-to-go breakout board at a great price and be up and running in no time. There are some great custom boards out there you can just buy for your projects. But once you get the hang of ready-made modules, you'll likely want to push things further and design your own custom PCB. You'll soon notice that off-the-shelf boards might not fit your exact needs. Plus, there is super rewarding about seeing your design professionally made, and even more so when it actually works. Alright, enough talk. You probably already know all this. Let's jump in and start designing our custom ESP32 board from scratch. There is nothing wrong using these modules. They are easy, compliant, and reduce the chance of mistakes. But today, I am looking for a challenge. Instead, I will use ESP32 chip directly. And in some cases, it could be even cheaper and more tailored to your specific needs. If you go to Espressive website and click the hardware button, you'll notice that there are multiple ESP32 options to choose from. In my recent projects, I have been using boards with ESP32 S3 chip. And I have to say, it's one of the best from Espressive. That's why I'm going with the ESP32 S3 model, but instead of using the modules, I'll be using the better chip. I looked at the ESP32 S3 datasheet, and we need to choose one of the ESP32 S3 variants for our design. We can check the comparison table in the datasheet to see the differences between each variant. The main difference between the ESP32 S3 variants is the in-package flash and PSRAM options. Since JLC PCB is sponsoring this video, I'll show you how to order and manufacture your boards through their services. You can either get the parts from another supplier and ship them to JLC PCB, or pick from their assembly part list. Second option is way cheaper for the small quantities. Let's check if the JLC PCB parts library has ESP32 chip. When I search for ESP32, a bunch of options pop up, so let's sort them out by price. Since it's a single chip, it should be cheaper than a module. And there it is. Lots of ESP options. To narrow it down, I'll search for ESP32 S3. I'm choosing this one because it offers a decent amount of RAM and is also a cost-effective option. Plus, they have a good amount of stock available, so it's unlikely to run out of the stock anytime soon. I'm using KiCat 9 and let's create a new project. Let's open the schematic editor here and get started. Here is our empty schematic. To add a symbol, we need to click right here, where it says Place Symbols. If you type ESP32 in the search bar, you'll only see ESP32 modules, but not the chip itself. So you'll either need to create your own symbol and the footprint, or download one from the internet. On the GitHub page of Espressive, you can find all the key iCAT libraries. Instead of creating my own, I think I'll go with the easier option. OK, I installed the official Espressive library, and if I scroll down a little bit, you can see our chip, the ESP32 S3. I am double clicking on it and placing it in our schematics. If you check out the ESP32 module, you'll notice it has a bunch of components around the chip. Those are the essential ones needed to make ESP32 work. We need to figure out what they are and add them to our schematics. You won't find that information on the datasheet, but Espressive has a schematic checklist. So what we need to do is copy the schematic exactly, including the values and even the zero ohm resistors here. OK, from the symbol menu, let's type in capacitor and place the generic symbol around here. We are also going to need some resistors. I usually just use one generic resistor symbol as a placeholder in the beginning. I also saw some inductors in the schematics. Let's grab one of those bad boys and place it here. From here, we can just copy and paste it, placing around the microcontroller, and try to match the schematic on the Espressive website. Before going any further, let's go here and add a new column, calling it manufacturing part number. The reason we did this is that now we can double click a component and it will show this column, allowing us to enter the part numbers. This makes it easier to order the parts later on. I'll just paste it here for future reference, click OK, and continue working like this for each part. This will make my life much easier when it's time to place the order. 
Okay, I created the entire schematic in KiCAD, and there is one thing I want to mention. It's about choosing the components, like capacitors or resistors, from the part list. For example, I'm not picking random part numbers from JLCPCB. I am using the basic parts list. Basic parts list is accessible from this link here, and if you click it, you'll get a set of components. The difference between normal and basic or preferred parts is that GLCPCB does not charge you engineering fee if you use those parts in your design. Not everything is included in this list, but basic parts like capacitors or resistors are mostly here. I strongly recommend using the basic or extended parts list if you want to make your designs cheaper to manufacture. Okay, I have more or less completed my design. In the middle of the schematic, I placed our microcontroller, the ESP32-S3, along with only the components needed to make the ESP32-S3 work. For the top part, I placed a few capacitors for filtering and added two LEDs. One of the LEDs shows if the board has power and other is connected to one of the pins to check if the board is working and to make the blinky code work. On the bottom part, I added a USB Type-C connector to program the microcontroller or use its USB functionality. Also include a voltage regulator and a lithium-ion battery charger. On the right side, I added extra memory. While the ESP32-S3 model we have chosen already has enough memory, adding extra wouldn't hurt. And this one was also in the basic parts list. I have placed an empty space to add the headers later on, but I haven't added them yet. It'll be easier to do that once we have finished routing the PCB, cause I'm not sure which pins will be on which side of the PCB yet. I'll come back to this later. Since our schematic design is complete, let's click on this button and start creating our PCB. To transfer the footprints to the PCB editor, we need to click this button first. Afterwards, we need to click the Update PCB button here, and all the footprints defined in our schematics will be placed in the PCB editor. But we shouldn't design the PCB randomly, we should follow the PCB layout guidelines from the manufacturer, especially for the wireless part. So try to match everything you see in the reference, especially the traces, component placements, angles, and how the antenna routing is laid out. Let's define our board constraints first. In the layers, I'll go to the edge cuts layer, select the rectangle shape, and place it to define the dimensions of our PCB. This is essentially how our board will look after it's cut down. Okay, I completed my design by following the notes from the Espressive website. Now let's add a ground plane. To do that, we need to click this button to draw field zones and then we'll define what type of plane it will be. I'll select the ground and draw a shape that covers the entire PCB. And that's more or less it. As a last step, we need to verify if everything is placed correctly. And there is a great tool for that in KiCad called Design Rules Checker. If we click that and click the Run DRC button, it will check the errors in the PCB and also fill up the ground planes in the PCB. We need to fix any violations or unconnected items that show up. Okay, I fixed the design violations and the errors on the PCB, so it's ready for manufacturing. If you want, you can also click this button to open the 3D view. From here, you can see how your board will look after manufacturing. For ordering, we need to send our fabrication files, specifically the Gerber files. To do that, go to File, then Fabrication Output. From there, you'll need to create the Gerber files, the real files, and the bill of material files, then submit them to your manufacturer. But there is also another simpler way to do this. If you click on the plugin and the content manager, there is a plugin which would let you generate everything with just one click, and it's called Fabrication Toolkit. Since I have already installed, I won't install it again. So if you install the plugin, it becomes easier. Just go to Tools, External Plugins, and select the Fabrication Toolkit. Then I click Generate, and all the necessary folders and the files are created for you. Now we have everything ready for our PCB for manufacturing. Just click Add Gerber Files, select the Gerber files that the plugin created, and the upload will start. After our PCB is uploaded, you can see and preview it from here. I am not going to change any settings, but I might change the color to yellow since the default was green. Apart from that, since we didn't do anything crazy, we can stick with the standard settings. And if you want to get assembled board, 
Click this button here and specify how you want your board assembled. The most cost effective option is to use just one side of the PCB instead of both sides. But the important one is to have them confirm the part placements. As sometimes mistakes can happen, it's cheap to ask and it's a good precaution. Also, part selection option is crucial. If you click this option, JLC PCB will select the parts for you. However, since we have already specified them, there is no need for JLC PCB to do this for us. It's always a good idea to check it yourself to ensure that everything matches your design requirements. I'm not going to specify any advanced options here because the default ones are fine. I won't change things like the solder paste or packaging type. If you need to, you can adjust these settings, but I'll stick with the default ones and click next. This is the next page you'll see if you click next. You'll need to add your BOM file, which is located under the production folder, and also CPL file, the positions file, then proceed to the BOM and CPL page. If you see this error, don't worry. It's because we don't have any parts for voltage, ground, and antenna. You can simply click continue. The BOM files will be picked up by their tool. However, I recommend checking all the parts to ensure they are correct, as there can be occasionally a few mistakes. If you notice errors like this, click on them and input the part number you have already assigned. This is the final page where you can preview the component placements. I recommend checking that all parts are placed correctly. For example, I noticed that our main chip isn't placed properly, so I need to rotate it. You can also do this type of small adjustments in this page as well. Similarly, USB Type-C connector isn't placed correctly either. It's always a good idea to double check everything before finalizing your order. Once you are satisfied with the placements, you can proceed with the order. After double or triple checking the component placements, just click the next button and your PCB will be on its way and you will have it in a few days. Well, the boards have arrived. Let's see what we've got here. It's always exciting to finally hold your freshly made PCBs in your hands after all that preparation. The final look is exactly what I hoped for. It's well made and neat. This means you don't have to spend time for soldering the PCB and saving you valuable time. They also include a blank array around the design. This space is necessary for the machines to handle and the position the PCB accurately. The fiducials on the board help the machines to recognize the PCB's coordinates, ensuring precise placement of the components. You don't have to add it in your design, but if you don't add it in your design, then they will add it for you. You can easily separate these extra parts from the main PCB and use them as you intended. But if you prefer, you can also tell them to put them in a certain place. It's really up to you. But if you want to produce them in larger quantities, instead of designing and sending a single PCB, you can design an entire panel. This approach saves space and can be more cost effective. But for small quantities like this, designing a panel isn't really necessary. It's only beneficial if you are producing a large number of the same PCBs. For smaller batches, sticking to individual board is perfectly fine and much simpler. Here how it looks once everything is separated. You could even sell them directly by having a manufacturer like JLC PCB ship them to your customers. Although I am not planning to sell these, you are welcome to make your own. If you decide to sell my design, that's absolutely fine with me. Just remember to remove my logo from the board. I am happy if you can make a profit from my design. I will put all the design and manufacturing files in the description so you can download them easily. Feel free to use them for your projects. Or you can use my design as a Kickstarter for your own projects. And here is our blinky code. Everything works fine. Wi-Fi and Bluetooth are both functioning right out of the box, so no tweaks were needed there. It's really nice to have it all set up easily. One thing I did notice though, it's that the board currently supports only 32 megabyte of flash instead of the full 128 megabyte. If you know how to use the entire 128 megabyte with the sp 32 s 3 please let me know in the comments so I can learn from you too. You can also use lithium-ion batteries with this port, so let's solder one and test it. And this is after soldering the lithium-ion battery to the PCB. You can of course charge it using an ESPC connection. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Just use it like this. It's simple, functional and ready to go. And this project is complete. You can find all the relevant files in the description, just download them. I think this turned out really well, since I didn't need to spend any time to modify the PCBs after they delivered to me. 
Of course, if you want, you can use another ESP8266 S3 variants because it's been compatible. But also, if you don't need 128 megabytes, you can also choose a lower amount of it, of course. So if you enjoyed this, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and see you next time.